Hey there, Arconiacs. This is a unified theory video for how all the main suspects tie into the story, and more importantly, who killed Ben Glenroy. It will contain some things I've mentioned in previous videos, and things released on social media, and everything up to Season 3, Episode 4 of the show. This will be a little different than some of my other videos. Some small tangents, there are many people with varying degrees of motivations, and figuring out who did what and why is very important. The answer isn't simple. I believe the arc of this story is a tragedy of errors, ill intentions, and a crime of opportunity. It starts with the end of season two, where Donna DeMio calls Oliver to direct her son's solo debut play, Death Rattle. In that phone call, Oliver states that he owes Donna money. With that information, I find it odd that she has chosen him, a director with a very bad track record, a virtually unknown play, and a man who has never acted on stage as its frontman. With her money invested, she then allows a woman who has never had a notable role in her life, a TikTok influencer, and others that as far as we know, have had no notable work on stage, be the ones turn into this ragtag group that for some reason she believes in. I believe Death Rattle was set up to fail by a woman who likely makes money off of failed productions. Donna's company is called DeMeo Productions. DeMeo is Latin for descend or go down, making its name synonymous with falling or failing productions. It does also mirror the death of the mother in Death Rattle. As the mother falls to her death, so does the productions financed by Donna. They even gave Ben a shitty dressing room to ensure he is unhappy every step of the way. But that's as far as they go. They would not resort to murder to make such a thing happen, but they didn't need to. The critic Maxine stated that she was going to pan it. It was bound to be bad. And I believe those are the extent Donna and Cliff's participation in the events of the season. Backing up to Loretta, who was once a young struggling actress, she gives up her child to her sister, who is better set up to take care of him. He grows up knowing her as his estranged aunt. Just before the woman he knew as his mother dies, she tells him the truth, and then Loretta tries to be in his life. But he is heartbroken, and he has had many issues trying to support the family he had, and he wants nothing to do with her, his real mother. So far to the point that he makes her sign an NDA so that she will never tell anyone who she is and how they are related. But Loretta still admires and is proud of him from afar. But luckily, from her nephew Dicky, she learns that Ben is starring in an upcoming play, Death Rattle. Loretta, in an attempt to get close to him and make up for the mental anguish and lost time, tries out for the play. And because of her personal ties to the character, she acts her heart out and she gets the part, leading to an awkward situation between the two of them at the first table read. This is why Ben is truly an asshole on every set he walks onto, and almost to everyone he knows. He talks a big game to Kimber, telling her he will support her entrepreneurial endeavors, but backs out at the last minute. In an attempt to get him back into supporting her, she makes him some cookies for the opening night with a picture of a rattle on top. She's hoping this will help her get back into his good graces. Ben walks into his dressing room and sees his plate of cookies. And this is the footage we see of Tolbert's. They look so good, but he knows they are bad for him. But Ben doesn't care, and he devours them, causing an allergic reaction, or possibly the food dye giving a red blemish on his face. This was not done from a punch by Charles, as Charles punched him on the left side of the face, and the blemish is on his right. Becoming crazed, he calls Joy to fix his blemish. She does so and leaves, and in a state of sadness, he calls himself a fucking pig for not being able to control himself. Ben goes out on stage not realizing that the cookies made him sick. Just like her kibble, the ingredients were all 100% human grade, 
So after Ben's stomach was pumped and he barfed a ton, it did not come back as being poisoned. The doctors did state that it was likely something he ate. And the jar on Kimber's desk called liquid venom in her dressing room is a reference to her concoctions being what gave him food poisoning. But to someone on the outside, it would look like an attempt at murder. Ben poetically killed in the same fashion as the victim in death rattle. Loretta wants the best for her son and was hoping that this would be a great time for them to do something fun together. And that is why she was devastated when she thought he was dead. But Ben thinks she's only after the fame and is using him to get her big break. This is why he calls her a snake. Ben apologizes to everyone, including Bobo. Ben promises that he will have no more no-nos for Bobo. Loretta knows better. She hears past these halfway apologies. She knows him better than anyone else here, aside from maybe Dickie, telling Jonathan that he will only think about letting him on stage. And it was interesting, Donna told Ben to not overpromise anything, because she knows that Jonathan is a better actor, and she doesn't want him making the story of Death Rattle seem as if it could actually be good. Loretta has spent her life wanting to make it up to Ben, but only getting the cold shoulder. She knows that his antics are partially his fault, and no matter what Ben says, whatever he wants to do, he is and will always be a dick. In a previous video, I used Calculatus Eliminatus to tell me that Bobo was most likely the killer, but I had no motive. Before that, I looked at some of the themes in Death Rattle to try and figure it out, so I decided to go back to Death Rattle to see if I could find a motive. What do we know of Death Rattle? Well, it takes place at the Pickwick Lighthouse in Nova Scotia during a hurricane. A mother is found dead, a rattle in her throat, and thrown off a lighthouse, and her baby is the only person thought to be in the room. The characters are the detective, played by Ben, the constable, played by Charles, Loretta, plays the nanny, Kimber, the godmother, Ty, the father, and Bobo plays the boatman. I thought long and hard, what kind of motive could any of these people have to murder the mother? What motives could any of they possibly share amongst each other? And how could that tie into the show, Only Murders in the Building, as the theme seemed to run parallel, removing the detective and the constable as people investigating are never the killer. I listened to Loretta's monologue from episode one. She was speaking to the detective, saying that a nanny acts as a mother because children need to feel protected and the lengths someone would go to to protect a child. This led me to think that whoever killed the mother did so to protect the child from the mother. And I can only assume that it was some form of abuse. And if this is true, every character has a variation of the same motive to protect the child. The father might have killed his wife due to a troubled relationship with the mother, possibly stemming from the abuse to the child. He could have snapped under the stress of the situation, especially with the hurricane's chaos, help providing cover for the crime. The godmother could have concerns about the mother's behavior towards the child. She could have felt compelled to take action to protect the baby. This could have escalated into a confrontation that turned violent, leading to the mother's death. The boatman is a bit of a hidden character but whose motivation would tie into the story, more so. Maybe he has witnessed the mother's abusive behavior or knew about her actions and seeing all the others not doing anything about it, leading him to take drastic steps to protect the child. A boatman of the lighthouse would be the only permanent person in the story. Everyone else is sort of passing through. This could represent duty and responsibility as the boatman ferries and guides passengers on rough waters. Many people put their lives in the boatman's hands, guiding them through darkness to the light, in a way, a beacon of hope for others. Much like the Statue of Liberty's flame is a symbol of freedom and hope, lighting the way to a better tomorrow. And the iconography of the Statue of Liberty has appeared quite a bit, most recently, in Joy's fish tank and at the end credits of episode 4. There are some parallels with the lighthouse and the Statue of Liberty and Bobo's character 
could represent some of these themes. You may think it could be a stretch to say that the lighthouse and the Statue of Liberty have similar meanings other than the light on top, but they both appear in the story. And what if I told you that the name Bobo is derived from a Slavic sloboda, meaning freedom or liberty. Bobo is liberty, and if Ben was an asshole to everyone working on the show, but claimed to do better, it would only take one conversation. Bobo asking Ben for one thing after his return from the dead, after he promised to do better. It could have been anything. He could have asked for a signature on his hanky, but Ben said no, because Ben is a dick, realizing that even near death hasn't changed him. In a moment of frustration, he pushes Ben, getting rid of a man that has views everyone on the set in one way or another, mirroring the reason the boatman may have killed the mother in the play, to protect others, for liberty, because he feels that everyone is better off without him. When asked, Bobo never stated that he would give his hanky to Charles for the quilt. He didn't say anything at all, but the most egregious thing Bobo has done that makes me feel that he loathed Ben was eating popcorn at his funeral. This is considered a faux pas, disrespectful, and in no way a common occurrence. If food is served at a funeral, it's part of a post-funeral reception for family and close friends. Not popcorn during the service like you're watching the next Avengers movie. Bobo shoves his popcorn in his mouth with such reckless abandon. It's not the face of someone in mourning. It's someone enjoying the show. The show he created. I understand you may not think that this motivation is the strongest, but alongside the other things that hint to Bobo, I think this is very plausible. I must talk about the elephant in the room, something I haven't factored into my theory, though I know it's a big one. The theory that Ben Glenroy is multiple people. There are some things that make it seem like it's a possibility. Ben Glenroy's three names. Death Razzle Dazzle has three babies. Maple mentioned something about birthdays, and I found it interesting that when Ben returned from the hospital and went to Oliver's apartment, Dickie told him that he had a call that he needs to take, and Ben talked about himself and a third person, stating Ben needs to take this, as if Ben was someone other than him. It makes me feel as if there could be some validity to it, and though this could be something that happens in the show, I'm not a fan of the idea. There's always some suspension of disbelief in the show. I love the over-the-top antics that would never work in real life, but I personally feel it's out of the realm of possibility that an actor with his notoriety could ever have a twin that no one would know about. Not just friends and family, but legally. They would have to have social security numbers, IDs, birth records, tax information. If this took place 100 years ago, I could understand it, but the way the world is with the technology and all the super fans, I just think it would have been known, even in his girl cop days. I like to figure things out logically, and to me, logically, this theory, no matter what hints we get for it, doesn't make sense. And it's okay if you disagree, this is my theory, so please leave yours down below. I will highlight some of my favorite ones in an upcoming video, what flaws did you find in mine, and most importantly, who do you think killed Ben Glenroy? If you could, Give this video a like, it really helps the channel get to more people, and I very much enjoy talking to you all about this show. Either way, thank you guys for watching. My name is Dallas, and I'll catch you on the rooftop.